take it away. Okay, so today I decided to do a topic on anesthetics and fish. I actually had the opportunity to do this this weekend, and I was like, this is so cool. So, um, and thanks for sharing. Yeah, no problem. Also, I didn't even realize you could do surgeries on fish. So I actually read an article about a woman who was willing to pay $500 to do surgery on a fish. <laughs> okay. um, there's actually a video uh, on YouTube of the fish doctor, and he's one of the few, actually. So he has a lot of surgeries if you want to uh, witness that. Wow. So we'll start off. So the three main types that were discussed were actually MS-222, benzocaine, and clove oil. Um, and anesthetics is defined as the insensitivity to pain, especially as artificially induced by the administration of gases or injections of drugs before such operations. With fish, it, we don't induce it with gas or injections. It's actually simply just a process of the powder solution in the water, and you just let them stay in there for a while until they get to a certain stage. Um, and so are you going to give us some guidelines about the uh, administering? Kind of. Because it's obviously got to be based on... It, I mean, there's a lot the of amount of water and the fish size. Um, well, yeah, depending on what you use. Um, so I'll go into that, especially with these three. The administration part also varies with species. Sometimes it doesn't work with some species. Sometimes sure. it does. And you got a question uh, yes. back there. Um, so, like, if they stay in the water too long, will it kill them? Uh, I'll actually go into that. Okay. A sorry. little. What kind What's the of, question? Yeah. Out of the water? Yeah. No, if they're like in, in the, the water, water with too the long. anesthetics for too long. Oh, I see. Yeah. So what you do is you like watch for the different stages, okay. and if you go too far, we're going to learn about sorry, it. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. You're like me. I sometimes I ask questions and it's the next slide. So I've been trying to be quiet. No, it's okay. It's not the next slide. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one I'm going to go through is clove oil. Um, when I first looked at it, a lot, of the, a lot of people, they named it as the humane way to anesthetize fish. But um, it's actually comprised of eugen oil, which is like around 95%. Uh, iso eugen oil and methyl eugen oil, and they said that these are the three components that actually in, in, induce the anesthetization? anesthesia. Anesthesia. Thank you. Um, because um, it's mainly used in humans to help with toothaches and such, um, it's super easily accessible. You can find it over the counter at your local pharmacy. Um, and in fish, it actually has a rapid induction, but they say it has a slower recovery. But um, it's not in, approved by the FDA, and that in their statement, they say it's because of its carcinogenic properties are not really conclusive. They still need to study it more, so they tell producers not to use it on their fish because they don't know how humans, how it will go into the food safety, or even if you let the fish back out in the wild, how that may affect the food chain. Um, so. I thought it was funny because a lot of people advertise it as the humane way, mm -hmm. but studies show that it actually may induce stress, more stress, and there was a couple studies that checked the cortisol levels in the various fish. Wow. Yeah. And so it was higher cortisol levels than the other anesthetics. Uh, that's mm. all I have for that. Yeah. Okay. So, and one way they also tested it was um, you can test for the pain sensitivity, and even though they seemed anesthetized, they pinched the tail and it still was moving, so it shows that they might still be able to sense pain uh, using clove oil. Uh, the next one is benzocaine. Uh, it's similar to MS-222, except it's less acidic and less water soluble. And because it's less water soluble, you need to create a stock solution by dissolving the powder in ethanol or acetone. So it's not as commonly used just because the pain of having to make the solution, at least that's what I was told. Um, but the good thing is that it's less toxic for humans than MS-222, but another thing is that it leads to prolonged recovery times in older fish, and it's also not FDA approved. And I was wondering, why isn't it FDA approved? It's in so many pain medications. It's really dumb. It's because they, no pharmaceutical companies want to support the studies, so they just don't do it, and so it's not FDA approved. But. And then the most popular one would be MS-222, which is actually uh, kind of similar to benzocaine. It's triacane methyl sulfate. It is the only FDA approved anesthetic for fish. So that's also why it's mainly used. It's also very uh, easy to use because it's the one that you just put in the water. It comes in a powder, so this right here is a popular brand. Um, mm -hmm. The only problem is that it is more acidic. So you would need to buffer it with a base. A lot, the most common one is sodium bicarbonate because it's baking soda, so you can find it in your grocery store. Uh, so this is where the doses come in. Okay, here we go. So uh, you, it's for surgery reasons. So based on 
uh, the aesthetic, aesthetic, how induced you want to place the fish um, is how much you'll give. So for if you want surgery for like a stage four anesthetic where the fish is immobilized, can't feel pain, uh, you're gonna give about 100 milligrams per liter. Per surgery. liter of water that Per liter in. of water, yes, that it, it is in. It's gonna be in. Yeah, um, I was told it's about like half a tablespoon per gallon, I think it was. Um, so yeah, but that number will also vary for species. Uh, if you want to look at the sources, there's a graph there that shows the different species and about how much you would give for each. For if you just want to tranquilize the fish, if it's moving too much and you need to do like a, a scale scrape or such, you can actually just tranquilize it. Uh, you can also use it for transport. Say aquariums might use it to calm the fish down if you need to transport to another one. So you don't need as much. Uh, so about two to three milligrams per liter of water that it's in. Uh, and then for it, this is actually also used for euthanasia, euthanasia of the fish. And they do that by overdosing the MS-222, uh, about three to 400 milligrams per liter. If you'll notice on the graph for species, about the highest they use is about 250 milligrams. So 300 is an overdose and will uh, euthanize the fish. But uh, to assure that it's been fully euthanized, you wanna keep the fish in there for about 10 minutes. Uh, to make sure that it has passed away immediately. Okay, I guess yeah. it might be coming up, but what yeah. kind of fish are we talking about? Are we talking about pet fish that you have for pets? All or just kinds anything? of fish. Just if you if you yeah. have walleye and you want to do something with a walleye? You, I would suggest looking it up okay. and not doing it yourself, yeah, letting yeah. a veterinarian do it because of the species <laughs> variation. Like, I want to do it myself. For example, they advise they don't use this for zebrafish. They have another way, or I think they give okay. a higher dosage. Yeah, okay. um, so it it's very species dependent. Okay. But like when we did it, we did it with tilapia and yellow perch and okay. that they did that and it worked fine. Um, another thing is, like I said, benzocaine is less toxic in the dosage that you give for fish anesthetics. But this is a little more toxic to humans, so you want to always wear uh, protective equipment and always do it under a hood, preferably. Okay, weighing it out and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Because so that makes a good point. Your skin mm -hmm. can absorb a lot of chemicals, and you got to be careful. You know, it's and transdermal. Actually, also another reason to wear gloves is you don't want to um, hurt the mucous membrane of the fish. You might have stuff on your hands that can uh, cause a disease. So you want to always wear gloves, and if you wear gloves, it'd be advisable also maybe just rinse those gloves in distilled water to wipe off any powder or anything that was on those gloves as well. Uh, and so here we have some setup examples for how they set it up. It's actually, you can go really complicated, like here. Uh, some people will get really complicated, have like a whole table out. They'll put uh, an oximeter because MS-2 can, uh, you want to make sure they don't become hypoxic. So they'll have an oximeter and a Doppler uh, probe to kind of also measure heart rate. Um, so if you get really complicated, you can also get very simple, like this guy here, he just kind of made uh, his own little station, so that way the uh, fish can lay in, uh, what was it, dorsal like recumbency? Yeah, yeah, dorsal recumbency, so. Yeah, it's dorsal recumbency. Season. Yeah, and um, the, how you anesthetize is not only putting the fish in the water, but uh, to maintain the level, you also uh, have a tubing. You can either put it in its mouth and have the water flow through in its mouth through outside its gills, and it'll just pass the water with the anesthesia. Another way is just putting it over the gills. So um, one of the veterinarians actually said her setup is super easy. She just takes a 10-gallon 10, uh, 10 tank aquarium, puts a, has a gate, put it a foam on top, and just has like a, a pump. Similar to this, so you just have the tank, you have the gate, and then you just have like this foam laying on top, and you have the pump with the tube of water into this, and it goes out the gills. The foam absorbs it and drips back into the tank, so it's just a continuous flow of the anesthetic water. Um, and this is similar to what this guy is doing. And you don't actually always need a setup. If the surgery is super quick, like maybe nine minutes, you're gonna do something quick, or if you're gonna do like a simple gill biopsy or another skin scrape, you can just anesthetize the fish, lay it down, and you don't have to keep using water. I mean, it's suggested maybe every three minutes to prevent them from waking up, but you don't, but if you're, it's gonna be fast, then you don't have to worry about setting everything. Sometimes a simple syringe over the gills will do. 
Uh, so, last thing I have is actually the reactions and recoveries to kind of test the levels. So I'll just show you the stage four and five in the video, but you're welcome to look back at this video. It's by the fish doctor. He'll show you the, all stages of putting a zebra fish inside an exercise water and watching their reactions, how they slowly, how to tell when they're ready for surgery. <laughs> But the ideal is between stage four and five, as they call it. That's where you'll see the fish kind of float to the bottom. They can't keep themselves up and proper, so they'll lay on their side. They'll have a decreased respiratory rate and heart rate, and no response to external stimuli. So if you pinch their tail, they just stay. Um, also, you can look inside the gill color. It's easier for a bigger fish. Instead of that bright gill red, it'll be like a light red or pinkish. And you'll notice equilibrium loss by them just being on their side. Uh, and then the recovery is super easy for fish. You just put them back in just plain fresh water. Fresh water. Yeah, they're fresh fish. And um, so another reason you can you can decrease recovery time with bigger fish, especially just by grabbing their mouth and moving them slowly, so you increase the oxygen oxygen flow. Uh, some people also just put tubes to uh, push the water, the clean water, through through their gills, so they wake up faster. Hmm. That's the video here. So this is the fish just flopping over. Uh, you still see movement in the tail, so they still have some function. So they haven't reached stage four mm -hmm. yet. And that's they're the, testing, right? There. That's the testing, yeah. You just pinch their tail. So you can still feel it, so it's not yet. That one's ready. And this is the stage four, kind of what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see like him, his uh, breath is slower than this one here. And stage five, both, all their respiratory rates have decreased and they have no equilibrium balance and so and no uh, stimuli to external. No reaction to yeah, the no probing. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it shows that. And then he shows uh, their recovery. So he's just placing them in fresh water. You can see their respiratory rates start to increase. Um, it's so kind of a race. Water. Who gets to go upright first? Oh, there we and go. So it's as simple as that. Uh, and this is brand they just new. Just swim a little groggily as he describes. He also mentions that maybe for the customer's satisfaction, you can like move the fish. You can always move the fish so it looks like you're doing something instead of letting them swim groggily. Mm -hmm. But then they're fine. Wow! Look at that. The fish doctor. Yeah. That's, That's what you got. Go back to your PowerPoint. Go back to the slide where the guy's outside doing something. Yeah. Okay. Tell me, what okay. What are they doing? I mean, you told us how to give them anesthesia, but why do you do this? What are they doing? It depends. Um, like, one of the fish doctor has a video where he actually had to do this because he had to take out an eyeball and clot it. Um, I think it was punctured or something, so... Forgot, but okay, so he took it. out an eyeball. Yeah, there's several. Also, another reason to do it's like we did it to do blood sampling and collection. It's a lot easier when they're an SSI. Um, I forgot. There's this was part of. This guy looks like he's, he's like works for the DNR or something. Yeah, yeah they were doing some sort of study, but um, could be maybe collecting eggs. I don't know. I think you can do that while they're doing it. Okay, so yeah, I don't know. That's a. Is there a question oh, back there? I have two things. So yeah. why would you ever need to put a fish down? Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm asking, you know. Tell her, why do you put a fish down? I mean, I guess, like, for maybe DNR reasons, you're doing a study, okay. you want to euthanize the fish and check, or maybe you're doing an experiment with fish to do a necropsy, you want to put them down. Gotcha. Yeah. So as a I can see where you want to sample a population yeah. and see internal parasites yeah. and all that. And Actually, we found a fish, a yellow perch, and when... But they they did the same thing. We did blood sampling with it, and then we euthanized it. Did necropsy. We found this long parasite, like that big, in the fish the whole time. Yeah. Okay. Now, how do you take a blood sample? Okay. So you can go. There are two ways. So oh, I don't want a picture of the fish, but imagine a fish, the tail, kind of like if you kind of judge the center of the fish where the spine is. If you all eat fish, you can tell the spine. Um, you can do a uh, ventral approach, so you can put the fish in like this kind of position, um, where it's a uh, bottom and the, the anal fin, yeah, yeah, like this. The anal fin's pointed up, so you okay. can go from the tail and do a ventral approach, and you just kind of uh, put the needle straight down so you feel the bone, 
and you want to back it up slightly and apply a vacuum to see if you can pull blood. There's like a vein right underneath the spine. Um, so you're going way down to the spine? Yeah, you're going to reach down to the spine. It's actually not as far no, as okay. it seems. And then, then you're just going to pull back, create a vacuum, and try to get blood. It's a lot harder. It's <coughs> kind of a potluck deal then a yeah, little bit. Yeah, so you could go behind the anal fin. Another reason is when it's laying flat on side like this, you'll go back to and um, kind of find that lateral line in the back of the tail. And you're going to go under the scale. You don't want to go through the scale. It's too hard. Under the scale. Under and the then scale. turn your needle perpendicularly and go into the bone. And then kind of find the vein from there. That way it was a little easier. Now that reminds me of how you take blood samples from cattle, the tail. It's all blind. You hold their tail up. And in this case, you take a needle. And I always go perpendicular to wherever the tail's at. And you actually go in and touch the bone of the tail. And then you pull back. And it ends up being the first vessel back from the bone is vein, and then the artery is further out. And when you're doing tail blood samples from cattle, it doesn't matter if you get arterial blood or venous blood, but that's how you do that. You, know, you touch the bone and then you come back. Slightly, so yeah. it sounds like that. It's a lot harder. Sometimes you might end up like moving your needle, or sometimes you want to rotate the bevel, that can help. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's an art, yeah. Let's give those two people a round of applause. Excellent. Okay.